greatly appreciate your presence tonight. Have you ever walked around an old cemetery? And have you ever seen the small stones, the broken stones, or maybe those that have just through weather and time are no longer readable? But I always think about it and I go, that marker represents a life. Mostly forgotten by people, but not by God. I think about that. I mean, I, I, my dad's family, a lot of them are from the Frankton, Indiana area. And one about 10 years ago, when my family decided they didn't want to get together for Memorial Day, I did the Memorial Day thing with Sheila, and we went and looked for my ancestors in cemeteries. And there were several of them with the name Webb, which I have a relation to. And I saw broken broken stones, and I said, that's, I don't know how they're related, but they are related. But I said, how, how would you change that? And looking at these things. But when some people die, you might hear the saying, leaving the world no poorer, this person died. Now, I stole that. Now, Trace will appreciate this. I got that from a Batman graphic novel. Not a comic book. It's a graphic novel. Trace is nodding his head. And that's the, the comic book nerds. We all call it the graphic novel because we don't want to admit that we still act like we did when we were five and six. But uh, when we die, though, what will people think of us? Or think about our death. Will the world be better off or no poorer? Leaving the world no poorer is the title of this lesson. And we have an example of someone who could be considered that way. In Second Kings, the ninth chapter in verse 30, we read about someone named Jezebel. And when Jehu was come to Je Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. And she painted her face and tired her hair and looked out at a window. And as Jehud entered in at the gate, she said, Had Zimri of peace who slew his master? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. And he said, Throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses. And he trode her underfoot. And when he was come in, he did eat and drink and said, Go see now this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. And they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Wherefore they came again and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, This is Jezebel. Now, Jezebel's part in the mur murder of Naboth to get the vineyard that her husband, King Ahab, coveted was to lead to her ending. And we read that in 1 Kings 21. We'll start at verse 17. It says, And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. And behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak to him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast killed and also taken possession. And thou shalt speak to him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found thee, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee. Because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and will take away thy posterity, and will cut off from Ahab him that urinated against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel, and will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha the son of Abed Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. And him that dieth of Ahab in the city shall dogs eat, the dogs shall eat. 
And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. And there was none like unto Ahab which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. And he did very abominably in following idols according to all things as did the Amorites whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. It came to pass when Ahab heard these words that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days I will bring the evil upon his house. Her evil was punished by God. Was the world better off as she was a murderess? But of course, we realize that everyone is a sinner. In Romans 3.23, it reads, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, was the world better off because of her death and being eaten by dogs. Isn't that a lovely thought? You know, that is the ultimate in disrespect of anyone's body after they die. And we have to realize that we are all soiled by sin. In Galatians 3 and in verse 22, it says, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin that by the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up in, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We are all soiled by sin, but we can all be covered up. You know, I, I know a lady. She lives in the Avon area, but she used to go to Rosedale, as I did. And she worked at the Terre Haute County Market. And she said, sometimes you have people who are, shall we say, a little less clean than the standards of the community. And one day there was someone who was so, shall we say, soiled that they stuck a bar of soap in with his groceries. And you know what happened? The smelly man brought it back in an attempt to get money back for it. See, God gives us soap. And, you know, I, I, I've told the story about Mr. Edwards going to his house. Mr. Ed, he was a friend of my father, but he was not considered the cleanest of people. And I said, Mr. Edwards, can I use your bathroom? Yes, it's over there. I go in there, and I discovered the bathroom was fine, except it, his bathtub was a fine place to keep his firewood because he had no other use for it. And... God gives us the soap that cleanses our soul. And just like that man at the county market, not everybody's going to use it. John, in 1 John, the first chapter, and in verse 5, it reads, this, is, this then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Just like that man county market. We can give people soap. We can say, your soul needs cleaning. Here's the soap. But they have to use it. And you know what? We Could you imagine we decide, we're going to do a, a, a congregational project. We're going to walk all over a particular town, whether it be Sheridan or Lebanon or Advance or 
Thorn Town, in any of these towns, and we put a bar of soap in there. What would people think? Do you think I'm filthy? To say we have no sin is kind of like being covered with mud and telling everybody that we just took a bath. the need to avoid hypocrisies is apparent. I, I've had conversations with people saying, well, kids need to be dirty once in a while or they won't get any, uh, they won't be immune to bacteria and things and they need the good bacteria. I had this conversation this morning at, at, at Delphi and whether that is or not, I was never one that liked to be dirty, but when I did get dirty, I did know to get clean. We need to avoid the hypocrisies of saying that we're clean when we're not. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh, ex speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ." Nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained, but refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise pro profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, we therefore, or for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Now, not everybody's going to take care of their soul's filth. But God loves them still and wants everybody to be saved. That's something we should take solace in. God wants us to be saved. He doesn't want, he doesn't take any pleasure in people being condemned to hell. John the third chapter and in verse 9 verse 9 Jesus tells Nicodemus answers and says how can these things be and Jesus answers and says to him art thou a master of Israel and knowest not the are, are and knowest not these things verily verily I say unto thee we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and you receive not my our witness if I have told you earthly things and you believe not how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things and no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds might may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. God loved the world. Can you imagine loving anyone enough that you give up your child, that you have that child die in a most terrible, horrible, painful way? I can't imagine. You know, the trouble I, Sheila and I had in becoming parents and being told to sacrifice that child. I cannot imagine that. You know, are we, do we love anyone that much? But God did and does. 
Romans 5 and verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts for the Holy, by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us, for when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So, did God love Jezebel? That's an interesting question. I don't know of many women who are more wicked than Jezebel, do you? I'm certain there's got to be someone out there who's fairly wicked. The, the answer is, of course, God loved Jezebel. He was, she was his creation. Did she leave the world no poor? I'll have to let you draw your own conclusions. We all lit, leave the world in a poor condition, I will submit. And it depends on the righteous things we did and the righteous things that we should have done but didn't. We don't want to hear the words as in Matthew the 7th chapter and in verse 21. Matthew 7 and 21 We'll read 21, 22, and 23. Not every one that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I didn't know you. You didn't make yourself one of my children in the spiritual sense. What a shame to the world if we don't do everything we can to lead others to righteousness. How many haven't left this world any poor? I don't know. All sinners leave the world a little poor, though, I would tell you. Because they should have left it better. We don't want to waste our life. That's so many times I think about it. A life wasted. We need to save our souls. We need to do our best. Do what we can while we're still here to save others and to save ourselves. In Galatians, the sixth chapter, we'll read in verse 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. What can you do? 
there's plenty that we could do as far as well doing. You're here. That's a good step, isn't it? To hear the word of the Lord, to worship God, to sing praises and to learn from his word. I think that's wonderful. It's great that we are here to do that. Well, what are we going to do the rest of the week? Are you reading the word? Are you getting your Bible out and studying it? A good guide to that is, you know, Wednesday night services. You know what? I am reading more Bible since I have taken on teaching duties. And I'm looking at other, you know, scriptures and studying the word in hopes of making it sound like I actually know what I'm talking about. I know sometimes it might be a little weird, but I try not to be in hopes that I can learn it and I can learn more about it and teach others. People talk about, you know, how do I hear the word? Well, you know what, you know, God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit and the inspired writers that we, when we read the scriptures. We hear it when we hear preaching. We hear it when we go to Bible studies and gospel meetings. We learn so much more, you know, Romans 10, 17 talks about to hear the word. You know, when we hear the word, then we have to talk about what to do. I was at a funeral Thursday thinking of happy things. Lady at normal had passed away. She was 84 years old, you know, full of years. And Brother Ed Bridegroom, he's actually been to our meetings a couple of times, but he did the sermon for the funeral, and he was talking about the steps of salvation. And he was saying, you know what, when you hear the word, then you have to take it very seriously and say, do I believe this? You know, he who believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. Mark 16, 16. He says, do you believe that? And you have to take that seriously and say, is this something that I believe? And if you do, then you have to make a decision on what to do with your life. Are you going to repent of your sins? Are you going to repent of your sinful lifestyle, the lifestyle that separates you from God? And if you don't take care of that, you'll be separated for eternity, and you'll never, you know, hell is a place of darkness. You never see anything again. Can you imagine that? Eternal darkness. That, that would drive me crazy in eternal torture. And if you change your ways, then you have to take more action. You, you know, you say, you make confession with your mouth, but, you know, as in Acts 8, you know, what the Ethiopian eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He makes those steps, you know. Here, you believe repent and you confess. Then you are baptized for the mission of your sins. The Ethiopian eunuch was looking for water because he wanted to wash away his sins. A lot of people make fun of us. Oh, you're water dogs. You just, you, you just water, water, water. Well, you know what? I'm not asking you to do anything but what God tells you. If it takes eating chocolate ice cream, save your soul, would you do it? I don't know. I don't like chocolate ice cream. I'm sorry. Chocolate makes me sick. It, it literally does. How would you like to be allergic to chocolate, folks? I am. That's okay. I never really cared for it. <laughs> you know, get a list of foods that if they banned it, you wouldn't care. In my case, it's chocolate. Sheila, that's, that's blasphemy. <laughs> And you've been baptized for the mission of your sins. And then you live faithfully to, and to death, as in Revelation 2 and 10. To save yourself. Don't waste your life. If you were to die this day, where will you wind up being? You know what? I was talking to this, lady, this deceased lady's husband. He goes, as far as I, I'm pretty sure she's probably there. And I said, well, then you're going to have to behave yourself so you can be there with her. And even if she's not there, you better behave yourself because you don't want to be where she's at and she don't want you there either. Have you 
cleansed yourself. Don't leave the world poor because of what you should have done, but because people will miss you and your good example. That's our lesson. There's an invitation song selected. The invitation applies to you in any fashion. Please come forward and make your wants known while we stand and while we sing.